Hi everyone. So today we have Sumit Dutter with us and uh, myself Akshay Toshniwal from AI Time Journal. And uh, you know, I would like to welcome Sumit to our podcast series where we will be, you know, talking about AI, deep learning, and how AI could be used in business and what the future looks like. So uh, Sumit has, you know, more than eight years of experience working in AI, machine learning, and deep learning. And uh, it's, you know, a great pleasure to have him on board with us on this podcast. So with that, I would, you know, love Sumit to introduce himself and, you know, we'll kick off further asking him some interesting questions and hearing his experiences out. So over to you, Sumit, please. Hi, um, I'm Sumit and uh, I have close to eight years of work experience, specifically in the machine learning, deep learning and uh, computer vision space mainly solving real world problems uh, in the retail space as well as the healthcare space. Currently, I work as a machine learning research engineer with 7-11 R&D, uh, wherein uh, we apply AI to solve problems in the retail space. Prior to that, I worked at two startups back in India. Uh, in one of the startup, I was working on apply deep learning for face recognition as well as cervical cancer based whole slide image detection and as well as non-invasive techniques for uh, identification of oral cancerous regions. Uh, so the first time I got introduced to this whole computer vision was when I did my thesis back in my undergrad and that was related to non-invasive techniques of identification of cancerous lesions in uh, endoscopic images. Uh, I've done my master's in computer science focused towards artificial intelligence and software engineering. Mm -hmm. I have my undergrad in uh, biomedical engineering. Okay. Okay. That's great. Thank you so much uh, for your wonderful introduction. And I see, you know, coming with a background of eight years of experience and uh, working immensely in uh, machine learning and specifically into computer vision, deep learning. I'm sure this discussion is going to be, you know, with filled with a lot of insights. So, you know, that brings uh, myself to the first question about uh, what do you think, like how have you seen AI, uh, or maybe you can be more specific on deep learning, uh, be an influence starting up a new business. So, you know, how AI and the emerging technologies help, uh, you know, create that impact and influence on starting a new business. So uh, first thing is it, it depends on the kind of business. So mainly I think a business since I worked in a startup, uh, I worked in the startup background. So kind of mm -hmm. first you identify the problem and then you apply a solution to fill and then uh, that's how you start your business, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so first is you need to identify your problem. So what has happened is I think after 2012, when the first emergence of deep learning happened, um, especially in the computer vision space, um, the accuracy of uh, recognition of uh, any objects in an image, which was at, you know, like high 80s or high 70s, suddenly it got pushed to like high 90s, right? So once that happened, suddenly a lot of uh, business problems could be solved directly with AI. Uh, that is one thing. And second thing is um, a startup is not like Google, which has like tons and tons of data all the time, mm -hmm. but um, they have to start somewhere and uh, build a solution. Uh, deep learning algorithms are uh, useful in these situations wherein you can use techniques like transfer learning, feature-based learning, uh, wherein with very less data, you can actually uh, see meaningful results coming out. Uh, so that way, it's relatively easy for a startup to start a business in AI uh, once they know the nuances in deep learning, like transfer learning. Because with very less data, you can solve a lot of problems in today's world. Right, right. I think this yeah. is a very important point, you know, because what happens is that many people are concerned and confused that uh, AI always requires a huge amount of data. But I think this technology, this concept, and this methodology of transfer learning is trying to overcome that challenge. Definitely we'll be, you know, uh, understanding more from you on this, that how do we train, you know, deep learning models and build deep learning models with less data. Obviously we'll be talking about that, but you know, uh, when we talk about business, what do you think, like, how do you implement AI into the work for your business? So some of the real time 
applications that you could talk about? Um, so first when I started off was on a non-invasive detection of oral cancerous regions. Okay. Um, so sometimes it's very hard for a doctor to actually see some uh, regions uh, inside the mouth. Uh, that is one thing. And second thing is sometimes there are regions or like uh, when I was working, it was in like rural part of India where there is scarcity of doctors. So you can train like technicians to actually kind of take the images and then just have a rough estimation of where the cancerous regions are. Uh, that was in the oral cancer space. Uh, then next, when I moved on to like face recognition with deep learning, as well as uh, can uh, cervical cancer based, uh, a whole slide based cervical cancer region detection. Mm -hmm. So here, when it came to like face recognition, it was basically uh, some kind of an automated attendance system, as well as like a, okay. a verification kind of a system to make sure people don't uh, game the system. And mm -hmm. also it's like, instead of going with the manual way of annotating, uh, you automate the entire process. Mm -hmm. And for cervical cancer base, it's like basically, uh, it's, it's like the whole slide images are like huge. And then there are like so many uh, regions available. Uh, so it's very hard for a doctor to like go through each. So you can actually right. like detect with the help of AI. And mm -hmm. uh, now I'm working in the retail space, uh, trying to see how uh, customers uh, interact in a store and try to apply AI and solve the problem in like uh, product identification, uh, people count, uh, some problems in the supply chain and things like that. Uh, so kind of this has been my journey uh, working in the AI space. Great. That's, that's really amazing. So I'm sure maybe, you know, uh, as you worked these many years and with different applications in healthcare, in retail, currently you're working in. So uh, what do you think, how it increases the productivity and what kind of strength AI has to offer, you know, when it comes to such kind of business applications? So uh, one thing that I've noticed is um, you automate most of the repeated jobs. Mm -hmm. And that is one thing. And second thing is um, you just have to, trust the system initially when you start it just doesn't give you like the best accuracy uh, right. it just takes some time because it's not about getting lots of data it's about getting good quality data once exactly. you get the good quality mm -hmm. data i think the accuracy improves so you just have to trust the system like okay i'll just give it some time and this is going to get better mm -hmm. and uh, once it gets better sometimes it can be like near human level accuracy uh, so a lot of lot of tasks that way gets automated uh, wherein mm -hmm. uh, you may not uh, require a, a human uh, to intervene and then help solve the problem kind of the ai takes over and um, helps with the uh, so the helps with the problem by giving these got solutions it, got it got it mm -hmm. and you know when it comes to your work specifically or how mm -hmm. do you think that AI could help, uh, uh, you know, thinking from the future perspective? So how it could possibly lead to your benefit in the work front in terms of productivity, in terms of efficiency? Uh, what do you think about that? So one thing that I can actually say is uh, you can automate a lot of processes, uh, but also there should be some... Um, human involvement at some point. Uh, you can't like fully uh, leave it for the AI to take over. Uh, you need some involvement of human. That's what I've noticed. So it's like maybe uh, some percentage, uh, the AI can actually uh, help with solving the problem. And then mm -hmm. you need uh, some of it for the human to take over. Say, take for example, any uh, abnormality in a biomedical image. Mm -hmm. uh, the doctor is an expert in identifying the lesions because right. he's qualified to actually tell. Right, right. Um, the, the AI can just assist him and make him diagnose faster. It's mm -hmm. not completely taking over from him, but it can kind of helps him diagnose faster by you know just showing off the various points. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the doctor can actually look into it and then kind of see the pattern. So it kind of 
helps them and then um, makes their life a little bit easier more like a assistant you can say got it so that's yeah. you know maybe we can say that it's it's not completely artificial intelligence we can term it no. as augmented intelligence where you know you yes. have a combination of uh, you know humans with your uh, intelligent enabled systems that's absolutely right yes okay. yes. yes and you know you've talked about deep learning and uh, your experience surrounding it so can you uh, you know enlighten us with some of the thoughts on how do we build a deep learning model uh, from a customers you know from a customer centric approach and uh, what are the key things that one should take care of when working on a deep learning model or trying to build a deep learning model uh i think based on my research and my experience i mm-hmm. kind of have been lucky to work at the intersection of uh, engineering and product okay uh, i worked as a research engineer as well as a machine learning engineer right mm-hmm. so before taking the problem and then like having data and then just um, training a model and building the metric mm-hmm. it's so important to clearly identify the problem uh like right. i can give you an example when i started of working on oral cancer images mm-hmm. i actually went to the doctor and i could actually see patients who were suffering with oral cancer and used to like clearly show us where the cancerous regions are okay uh, same thing happened with even the endoscopic images i actually went to the gastroenterology department and the doctor was kind enough to actually show us as to how they actually insert the right. uh, colonoscopic device and then show mm-hmm. us all the images etc once you get an idea of that and see few images of actually what is the task and what you are actually identifying then you can go back and then look at some images visually by yourself and then train a model and then see how the model is reacting of course you'll have metrics accuracy f1 score and things like that definitely Mm-hmm. but this way what happens is tomorrow when you deploy it you clearly know that okay if i give this image this is how it's going to uh, look like and then this mm-hmm. is going it's going to help the end customer who's going to use it be it a doctor or be it any other technician or anyone mm-hmm. like that right so mm-hmm. that way uh, this kind of an approach actually help me once you clearly understand then you can start training a model that is one thing now the mm-hmm. second thing is it also depends on the compute the speed um and also um how the results have to be generated whether it's on the cloud whether it's on the edge things like that uh, even those things play a role uh, when mm-hmm. you actually go and see the uh, way people are using it is when you'll get an idea whether it's on the edge or whether it's on the cloud and then based on that you have limitations and then you'll have to decide on whether you need to go for like detection task recognition task or you need something more even mm-hmm. more crisp and things like that so based mm-hmm. on that you need to choose whether you want like a recognition model or a detection model and then you need to see whether you have ready made annotations available if it's a detection model or you can just start off with a recognition model and then slowly build by right. having like data pipelines and things like that uh, right. so kind of that's the approach uh, that one has to take uh, and this is specifically in the computer vision domain because i've been working most into the computer vision space got it, got it. so right from your you know uh, gathering your data and making sure it's relevant data it's not just yes. huge amount of data it should be a relevant yes. data then yes. you need to make sure that you annotate that data pretty well so that yes. uh, obviously the better you annotate the data the met, the better the machine will learn and accordingly right. your model will perform better that's absolutely yes. a valid point that i agree with right also right. Uh, you know you mentioned at the beginning that <clears throat> there's a concept called as transfer learning which helps yeah. you uh, train good models with the help right. of less amount of data so yeah. if you can you know share some thoughts on that that how can we build an effective or an efficient deep learning model with less data but obviously you know less data but good data yeah so these deep learning models are they generally um, there are of course transformers and convolutional neural networks specifically mm-hmm. convolutional neural networks is what has been like extremely popular these convolutional neural networks are these giant um, bunch of neurons 
that have actually learned patterns from the data. So uh, there are competitions like ImageNet, uh, wherein um, people have trained multiple neural networks with thousands or even millions of images, like cars, bikes, bottles, um, baseball bat, and things like that. So the neural network has already learned all the patterns already. Um, there are companies or also there are like research labs wherein they have taken that effort to actually train these models, which I think a, a regular a startup cannot do it or they cannot afford mm -hmm. it because you okay. need huge infrastructure for that. Okay. So there, so what happens is these uh, networks, they learn all these various patterns mm -hmm. and then those models are being like open source. So anybody okay. can use it. Mm -hmm. So for your specific task, when you have sufficient clean data, what you can do is you can leverage these uh, patterns that the neurons have already learned and then only learn specific layers, which is kind of towards the end because uh, convolutional neural networks towards the end learn more detailed uh, patterns. Like say, if you take a face, it's more like going towards identifying the eye, the nose towards mm -hmm. the end. Mm -hmm. um, so you can kind of learn only like the last two or three layers or maybe just the last layer mm -hmm. with your specific data and the model kind of um, performs really well with that. Okay. Because what you're doing is the initial preliminary layers, what even your data would do that's already been learned and you're trying to take advantage of it and then try to learn only the last few layers, which is very unique just for your data. Got so it. this, uh, using techniques like these mm -hmm. will actually help you solve your problem because you have less data. Got it. Got it. Got it. Right. Understood. Right. So instead of, you know, making the machine learn uh, with all the set of data and all the set of data points, basically, we are trying to make sure that the machine learns only the last set of points because that's how yeah. the model learns the most at that instance. Most. Maybe. Got that. Right. Got that. And kind of that is where you have like a distinction between different, different uh, objects of interest. Like say the difference between a bottle and a can will be kind of in those last few layers, but the Got initial it. layers are the same. Exactly. So that way you can take advantage of these. Correct. Um, that's that's yeah, really very interesting to know. That's right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's definitely very fascinating to understand, you know, right. how these neural network works. And I'm sure I've got to learn a lot uh, today. So, you know, um, again, uh, based on your experience and you work in the industry, what do you think are some of the primary skills that uh, one should have in order to, you know, implement AI for businesses and for uh, consumer products? So uh, what I have uh, noticed and what I have seen is that uh, if you have very good computer science knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, it can help you design good systems. Like say, uh, if you go, like I, how I was explaining, like if you go to a hospital site and see how the doctor is using it, like inherently or internally you're kind of learning as to how your system should look like and then you give mm -hmm. an image how it should be displayed to the doctor right so it mm -hmm. teach you need to learn how to design an entire system and uh, to design an entire system you need to have like software engineering skills uh training machine right. learning models is just like the very small part of it mm -hmm. because of course, you have a lot of neural networks and then you can do a lot of research and cope with your own. But sometimes you really don't have the resources. Kind of you end up using the pre-trained models. Mm -hmm. So not much, not much of effort goes into that. More into like cleaning your data and then uh, making sure you build a very good um, <clears throat> data pipeline so that you can reuse the data. Right. Uh, so for that, having very strong computer science skills will help. And also uh, skills on learning machine learning really well, basic techniques like gradient descent and then moving towards deep learning and understanding those nuances, like okay. transfer learning, batch normalization, there are various techniques like that. Right. Uh, these, okay. these like put together kind of um, help you become a better uh, machine learning engineer. It's not just the research part, but it's like, a lot of engineering 
and some amount of research and then Got also it. having that sense of how it's going into the hands of customer and how he's using it correct that correct, is correct. Correct. it's basically all about you know what kind of mindset you have and what kind of uh, basically a thought process or an approach you yes. basically take to solve any sort of problem that's yes. right got that yes. and mm-hmm. uh, you know coming to my last question uh, uh, what do you think uh, about the future of ai i mean uh, you know it's going to be uh, you know uh, now there are multiple emerging technologies also coming in like metaverse and ar vr and blockchain and we've got a lot of bunch of other areas as well uh, so what do you think about the future of ai like will there be a, you know sort of convergence between these uh, areas together or you know there are some sort of specific fields that you think will be you know disrupting the industries in the future what do you think about it so one thing is um, it will assist humans really mm-hmm. well it will assist humans really well maybe there could be a situation where a human cannot find something but the ai is going to find something but also it makes mistakes it's not always right uh, so you just cannot have one signal and then be like okay this is like the god decision maker which is going to give me the result no matter what okay. but it's more like uh, you need to have some room to correct mm-hmm. it and then mm-hmm. it gets better but it also makes mistakes so uh that way it will is uh, it will is and assist a human really well mm-hmm. and make uh decision making more efficient moving forward this is what uh, i've seen mm-hmm. and uh, of course even when you go with like the metaverse or any any ai based solutions mm-hmm. on the fly sometimes there could be misses and uh, sometimes it would be really accurate mm-hmm. so um looking at what are the fallback mechanisms to make sure the customer experience is still the same or getting enhanced by applying ai i think that should be the approach and pretty much that's how uh, i think businesses will function moving forward got that got that understood so mm-hmm. uh, i i really like uh, you know the kind of thought you have and uh how you enlighten all of us in uh, areas like machine learning deep learning and specifically into computer vision based on your experience so uh, really thank you so much sumit for uh, mm-hmm. you know spending your time with us and being a part of this podcast series by ai time journal thank you so much it was a pleasure hosting you tonight awesome uh, thank you so much akshay it was great yeah. talking to you yeah same here thank you